I am a bunny lady. That's my whole new personality. Masturbating to any kind of media was definitely MTV music videos. And I even wrote like silly little letters to Sasha Gray. My fantasy lately has been like kind of like zombie men, like taking like <laughs> hot guys and like scooping their brains out. Hi, my name is Bree Mills and I am a porn director with a purpose. Now, throughout my career, I have covered just about every niche and I've created some award-winning films and brands along the way. But now, I'm much more interested in getting to know the real people behind my characters. And that's because I believe adult entertainers can be some of the most powerful role models when it comes to sex ed, consent, empowerment, and wellness. By asking the right questions, our community can really help people better understand themselves. So that's the mission of this podcast. Let's get up close. Welcome to the podcast, Charlotte Sins. Thank you for having me. Am I close enough? Can you hear me? From I think so. I think okay. this is mostly for dramatic effect. Okay. I think either way, <laughs> we're well, good. Is the right? I'll stay here. Okay. Uh, I'm here. I, great. Well, you know, we've always had a lot to talk about whenever we're working on sets together. So it was like a, a natural fit for me to get you onto the show so that we could uh, talk even further. And I want to hear a little bit about what you've been up to lately. So I hear that you've got kind of a new hobby in your life. I do. I have a new hobby. I have bunnies now. I am a bunny lady. That's my whole new personality. I don't know what my personality would be that bunnies at this point. It's like my whole life revolves around it. But yeah, I got three bunnies and a dog and that takes up a lot of my time. <laughs> so that's been really fun. We were just chatting before, before we started rolling about how my family's been like anchoring for a bunny and I've been kind of resistant. So like, um, uh, if I ever end up with them going out and getting one, I uh, kind of against my wishes, I'm going to turn to you for some advice. I, what's been like the number one thing you've learned about, about bunnies? One, I thought they were rodents. They're not, they're lagomorphs. They're their own like subspecies. Mm -hmm. Like only other rabbits fall under that. Cause I was very like, I don't want a rodent in my house. They like poop and pee everywhere and they're not rodents. So that was like a huge thing. They're lagomorphs, which is a very cool word. And they can be litter box trained. They live a kind of a long ass time. I thought they lived like five to seven years, but no, it's like seven to 11 years. Like they live kind of as much as a dog. Um, but they're just like, I don't know, they make you very patient. Like I've learned a lot about like patience with mm -hmm. the bunnies, you know, cause like dogs, cats, you can kind of just trick them with treats and stuff. You know, they're kind of easy to like win the affection of maybe not cats so much, but definitely dogs. And that's what I'd had experience with, but bunnies, I'm like, I have to try to communicate with them on their own level. So mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time on the ground with them. <laughs> so I'm not like towering above them. So actually this morning, uh, my partner took a video of me just like laying on my floor with my bunnies, putting little pellets out. And he's like, how my girlfriend starts her morning. And then it's just me laying on my living room floor, surrounded by pellets and like lettuce. <laughs> so is okay. Before we, before we get in, get into, uh, uh, questions for today, I have to ask like, how does a bunny communicate? So, you know, well, what, what, what's it like they're living silent. with silent. Like they don't meow or bark or anything, obviously, but they thump, mm -hmm. which is really funny. So when they're pissed off, they like thump their little mm -hmm. legs at you. Um, they grunt, they flick, but they're very like emotive with their ears too. You know, like if they're perked up or perked back and, um, but they're not as easy to read, obviously, but mine are very, I don't know vivacious they have they're not like scared like they're very comfortable so they're not like sitting in the tor corner terrified they're more like running under my feet all the time very demanding for attention and food but it's been a lovely hobby to mm -hmm. adopt in my later 20s <laughs> There you go. <laughs> My early midlife crisis of getting bunny. Yeah, it, it happens. Yeah, there's yeah. like the sort of the crisis you hit when you're kind of roughly going to turn 30 and, and apparently bunnies are a good cure for that. It really was. I'm very happy with my choice. <laughs> so so just to contextualize for everyone, like why why we are why we're here, what we're chatting about today. So, you know, Adult Time has launched this year a new studio called Up Close. And the whole focus of that studio is to... Um, uh, 
really look at getting to know the performers that we work with on a more intimate level, a lot of unscripted projects, kind of the opposite of what we often do with our story-driven series. And the best way to get to know um, someone on a more intimate level is what we're doing today, which is just to, to get a chance to talk and to hear about your experiences, about you know your life stories, um, bunnies or non-bunny related. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's the whole mission for today, um, getting to know you. Uh, so let's start with a little bit about, you know, your, your upbringing, kind of where you come from, whatever you'd want to share on that front. Well, I come from humble beginnings. I don't know. I grew up just, uh, middle of nowhere, Utah, uh, adjacently Mormon, very Mormon family kind of in and out of the church, which is funny. Cause I think as you know, there's like so many ex Mormons in porn. Mm -hmm. I'm sure someone needs to write some kind of dissertation about what the connection is there, but there's so many ex-Mormons, so many people from Utah that are in porn mm -hmm. now. So I definitely fall into that category, but I grew up around a lot of animals, horses, had a rodeo family. So, um, I had a, yeah, I mean, I think of my child pretty fondly, like just lots of cousins because I did grow up in a Mormon family. Mm -hmm. I'm an only child, but I have like 500 cousins. So I never felt lonely or anything. People are like, oh, you wish you had siblings. Like, weren't you so lonely growing up? I'm like, God, no. Like mm -hmm. I spent all day with my cousins, seeing them fighting over like food and attention. I'm like, I got to be around that and go home and <laughs> be the only one. So it made me very like grateful for being an only child. But yeah, I got to spend most of my early memories, like spending time with my horses and with like cat, like barn cats and stuff that we had around. Uh, my family had a cattle ranch for many years and a logging farm. So I spent a lot of time like in nature on mm -hmm. farms, like rural America kind of growing up, I guess you could say. <laughs> and what uh, you're right in the sense that there are a, a, a large number of adult creators that do come from um, Mormon upbringings. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I, I'm sure you spent some time sort of reflecting on it with yourself. I mean, definitely. I think it's interesting because I think every organized religion is pretty like sexually repressed, mm -hmm. you know. But so it is interesting to think like why so many Mormons? Because I do think I come across more people that grew up. I mean, maybe because I think Mormonism, it's like you can't really be kind of Mormon or like culturally Mormon. Like there's a lot of people that grow up like sort of Catholic or sort of Lutheran, but like Mormonism, like you're either in, you're out. Yeah. It's not kind of like, a, oh, I'm sort of Mormon. Like that doesn't exist. You know, like you can't be like a Mormon who actively does pornography, but I think you can be a Catholic who does pornography. Like people can kind of, you know, couch those two beliefs, like have two separate things. Mm -hmm. But I think Mormonism is just kind of particularly... Um, like, and I don't know, kind of, I don't want to say culty because I think it's all kind of culty in my own opinion, but just very like hardcore. And I think if you come from a belief system that's very like black or white, right. you know, there's not a lot of nuance to it. Then you really swing, like the pendulum really swings, you mm -hmm. know? So if you grow up really believing in these things and then you get out of it, I think people tend to go from being like very sexually repressed. Like if I have sex with anyone except my husband, I will go to hell for the rest of eternity. Mm -hmm. And like hell in Mormonism is limbo it's nothing forever it's not mm -hmm. like brimstones and fire it's like you're just alone all the time forever which is terrifying mm -hmm. so i think if you go from that to like your whole worldview disillusion you kind of go complete opposite direction of like i'm gonna fuck everybody so i mm -hmm. think for me and a lot of people i know that's kind of what it was like they grew up so sexually repressed just kind of like beaten to their head their whole community so then when they broke out of that it was just like you go complete opposite direction in that. Yeah. Well, and it's, I think sexuality is so heavily nuanced, right? It's so uh, totally. unique to every individual, regardless of your relationship with it, that the more you try to confine that or put that in a very rigid box, the more likely someone's going to break free from that or need to just because yeah. it is so nuanced. What are some of your earliest memories of, you know, kind of I wouldn't call it sexuality is because of course, like when you're growing up, you don't necessarily know that that is what it is. But if you were to look back on your own life, like where do the traces of your, you know, sexual identity stem from? Um, I mean, my parents were kind of hippies too. Like my own parents weren't more when the rest of my family was, but my parents are pretty, uh, you know, like atheist sort of kind of deadhead people. Mm -hmm. So I went to a lot of like bluegrass shows or there was like 
people walking around naked and stuff in those environments, kind of like more chill. So I think that I had like kind of weird too cultural things happening where I was like in a family that was super Mormon and repressed and like in schools. And I still like went to church with some of my family members. And then my mom would like take me to like a string cheese incident, you know, like jam band at the gorge weekend. And it was just like, so I, I'm kind of grateful for that. Cause mm-hmm. I definitely didn't grow up as like repressed and forced into that ideology as a lot of like my friends and family members. But, um, I think we were going to talk about earlier, like music, I think has a lot to do with early sexual memories you Mm -hmm. know like just being at concerts like being at festivals and stuff and seeing people like making out and stuff like I remember when I was a kid we were like walking through a parking lot and someone was giving their boyfriend a blowjob in the car and I looked over and my mom was like (gasps) (laughs) covered my eyes I mean I saw it but yeah she you know just like I had these kind of two different things going on but yeah I think for me just I definitely like took notice of you know adults like making Mm -hmm. out and stuff Mm -hmm. I kind of want to do that and then you see you know, I think I was telling you my first like really memory of like seeing a naked man and being kind of like, I think I like that was Shannon Hoon on a Woodstock 94. Yeah. Boot cut. So I do remember like seeing a naked man for the first time and be like, I don't know why, but I kind of dig that. Like, yeah, yeah. I kind of like that a little bit. And my mom is gay. So to her, she's like, ah, oh, ew. You know, my mom was all very much like, oh, penis is gross. But I was like, I I think I kind of like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting how, like, within your your immediate family dynamic, it it, it sounds like there was a you know there was a, a lot of nuance there and a mm-hmm. lot of sort of freedom to like explore. But then it was surrounded by this really like you know kind of hard outer shell of you know conservatism and Mormonism. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of confusing. I think when you're a kid, when you're being told two things at the same time, because like when you're a kid, you think the world is so black and white, like there's a wrong and there's a right, mm-hmm. you know, but it's, so it's like kind of hard to pick up on the nuances that like maybe both things can be sort of true at the same time. Mm-hmm. So I think I was very confused <laughs> for a long time about it, you know, and I I would swing kind of in one direction or the other. Um, but I am grateful for it because I think it does give me a little bit more perception on like both sides of where people come from mm-hmm. sexually or otherwise. Mm-hmm. What are some of your earliest memories of masturbation? Honestly, I, God, I've hmm, specifically like definitely using shower heads. Uh, (laughs) You know, you go somewhere, there's a a removable shower head. That's like a, an invitation. It's going to be a long shower. So, um, you know, vibrating toothbrushes, all those things, but I've been a pretty, interested in sexual sexuality since I can remember like honestly some of my earliest memories but specifically definitely like I've never been a big porn watcher so I think my imagination is pretty vivid Mm -hmm. when I'm masturbating and I and since I've started masturbating it's been my most used tool <laughs> to do that. <laughs> so I, I have a question just because like, you know, in, in my era, uh, I don't recall there being electro- electric toothbrushes, but I think if I were growing up and I saw an electric toothbrush, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have necessarily put two and two in together that that could oh have God, an alternative really? use. Exactly so that's <laughs> my first, first is that thought. Just, <laughs> is that just me or is that like a generational thing or is it, yeah, like I, I guess it's like, when do you, when do you look at an object and be like, that is an object that could be inserted or vibrates, therefore, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've just, I've always said, I feel like I've been like a horny teenage boy in <laughs> yeah. my body for like a very long time. Just like, maybe I can hump that, yeah. you know, <laughs> like it's always been kind of a theme. I feel like throughout, especially like adolescence, I was very, very sexual. Mm-hmm. What, uh, you know, there's often a gap period between when someone first sort of like starts discovering their themselves and their body and then like actually has an orgasm for the first time. Do you remember when you first had an orgasm? And was it something that like, again, much like, you know, me trying to figure out an electric toothbrush, like it was like a eureka moment. You're like, ah, that's that's what I've been waiting for. Or was it like, I think it's like, because there's so many, I feel like for women, there's so many different kinds of orgasms, Mm. you know, so it's like I knew certain things felt good. And then it just developed and started to feel better and better. Because I think for me, I was experimenting with my body and pleasure and all that. So I think there was probably a point in time where it got different and better, you know, especially when I kind of knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't like an epiphany moment, you know, it was kind of like a slow evolution mm-hmm. over time. Um, I think uh, apart from Shannon Hoon at Woodstock 94, <laughs> although that's an awesome answer to my question, uh, you know, we're, we're obviously so influenced by what we see 
around us. And so, you know, I, I would be interested for you having grown up in the, with the sort of more conservative outer layer, like what type of media or pop culture were you exposed to? And is there any memories that you have of uh, something much like Shanahan's penis that made you go like, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute? Well, my parents are like super into music. So like music was always around and always mm -hmm. like MTV, you know, music videos were playing, going to a lot of festivals. So I think like, I mean, some of my earliest memories of masturbating to any kind of media was definitely MTV music videos. Like Shakira was a big one. I mean, those hips... They don't they, lie. They don't lie. Yeah. I mean, just seeing that and being like, do I want to be her? Do I want to like be with her? You know, you're trying to figure that out. I mean, definitely like spark something. But yeah, for some reason, I think the first ones. And then I also remember my mom was super into Prince and like Prince can get it. Like he's always like if anyone ever asked, like if you could fuck any celebrity dead or it's Prince. Come on. I mean, you know, he can lay it down. Like so. For, yeah, I don't know why, but my initial reaction would be say to Prince and Prince and Shakira probably are some of my earliest like sexual aha moments of yeah. like, oh, this makes me horny. Like this makes me feel something different. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny that you say Prince because I have a vivid memory of being like young and having a babysitter who was a teenager and getting invited over. Like, I think she had to take us over to her house once. And so we went into her bedroom and it was filled with Prince posters. Yeah. And she, she, it was the first time I ever heard the word sexy where she was like, <laughs> Oh yeah. Prince is so sexy. And I was looking at the picture going like, what? <laughs> But I, of course, like as a like a a little a little queer, I was like very on one end of the spectrum where I was like, Ugh. If, yeah, you know, like men in general, no, but like yeah. Prince especially does. So it's funny that that was like the opposite for you. And Jim Morrison, my mm -hmm. mom had a Jim Morrison poster that I just yeah ruled over. That I get. So, that I get. Yeah, I mean he's a babe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Shakira and Prince and a little bit of Jim a Morrison. Bit of Jim, yeah. What do you what What do you think? Um, well, I guess how did has how has your sexuality evolved over time? I mean, I think I've definitely gotten more comfortable with it. You know what I mean? Like comfortable experiencing it and telling other people about it, like just in general, not feeling like ashamed. Like I don't think I had as deep of a sense of shame around my sexuality as some other people who grew up Mormon, because like I said, I wasn't that entrenched mm -hmm. in it. So it wasn't like I felt like I don't think I ever really believed if I masturbated, I'd go to hell or anything like that. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think I really ever truly believed that even if it was being told to me, I think part of me was I'm like, OK, sure. You know, like mm -hmm. I didn't really buy into it. So I had the freedom to kind of explore it, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned that your mom is gay. Mm -hmm. So that that, you know, um, I, I would. It's funny because I call her gay and then she goes, no, you're gay. And yeah. I'm like, OK, <laughs> well, you're, it's kind of a gay thing to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, did you find like part of that that curiosity and exploration was sort of like looking at your sexuality and sexual orientation as well? And like, how did that feel in the type of environment you grew up? Was that something? I think, you easier? know, having like a pretty butch mom mm -hmm. was interesting because I want to meet your mom by the way <laughs> yeah I mean she's like pretty butch you know so she didn't wear makeup or yeah. like do her hair or anything kind of like laugh that off you know but I was like a very femme girl mm -hmm. and so my other mom is very femme so I kind of got that from her um but yeah I mean I I think I wanted to be like a more femme little girl but I'm glad I had that you know, experience of like seeing all sorts of different relationships mm -hmm. going on. Cause like my mom also had a relationship with my dad. I mean, I should call her bisexual. So it's mm -hmm. like to kind of see that sexuality and expression kind of live in all different forms, you know, mm -hmm. because I, my mom's not like a, a, a true lesbian, I guess, you know what I mean? Like a hardcore born and bred cause she's right. on all ends. So that's like a good example to have. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that you can kind of express yourself however you want. Mm -hmm. And she never was very like, you know, uh, changed who she was mm -hmm. to meet other people's perceptions, which I really appreciate. And I might be in the opposite direction. You know, I'm pretty like high femme, dressed kind of like slutty and stuff. But I think that like not really giving a fuck about what people think and expressing myself in a way that feels like authentic to me, mm -hmm. even my sexuality, I'm really glad that I feel that, you know, mm -hmm. and like have always kind of felt like felt that from a young age. Well, I, I'm a pretty big believer in the kind of the, the Kinsey scale approach to sexuality totally. where it is a spectrum and everybody falls somewhere along the line and and, yeah. and evolves over time, right? Like experience uh, yeah. begets experience. What do you think are some of the biggest myths about female sexuality? I think that women are like inherently or like biologically not as sexual as men or something, you know, that there's something like innate about us that makes us like not want to be as sexual or like not have as many mm. sexual partners. You know, I think there's 
some people might not want to admit it, but I think there is some people where there's some inherency of like being a woman makes you inherently want to be monogamous mm -hmm. or just have one partner and not interested in like being experimental. And I think, like I said, I feel like I'm more of a fuck boy than some of the fuck boys I meet, you know, like I don't think uh, your biological sex will necessarily indicate how sexually active you're going to be in your mm -hmm. life you know so i think just accepting that like women are very sexual maybe just as much or maybe even more than men in some cases you know i think that makes pe some people feel very uncomfortable to think about or to like think about certain women being sexual you know i think like something about men and sexuality just kind of seems inherent but we feel a little bit weirder about that you know mm -hmm. that like women inherently like want to have sex you yeah. know i think yeah. that puts people some nervous or something. Mm -hmm. I also, I was having a conversation the other day with someone who was like, well, you know, men are entirely visual and women are entirely like every other sense. And I, and I was like, well, I don't know if that's necessarily yeah. true. Um, but I, I thought an interesting thing that you said earlier was how growing up, you know, despite, you know, you know, really being open f with exploring your sexuality, um, that porn was never really a draw for you. Why, why do you think that? You know, I think it was for a certain amount of time, especially when I started thinking I wanted to do porn mm -hmm. and I was really watching a lot of it to be like, oh, you know, I could do this. I want to do this. But it's so funny when I was young, I, I thought being in porn was like, you know, being a famous actor, everybody wanted to do it. And it was just a pipe dream, you know, I'm like, <laughs> oh, everybody wishes they could do porn, you know, like who am I to think I could do it? And then yeah. I got a little older and I'm like, I mean, it's not rocket science. Like if I really want to do it, I think I could, you know, yeah. so I think I started watching porn vivaciously when I was a teenager, but more because I was looking at it in a way like I want to do that. Mm -hmm. Like I really want to do that with my life. And I even wrote like silly little letters to Sasha Gray and stuff mm -hmm. in my diary that I never actually sent, but just like, I want to be you someday. <laughs> it's just like so silly to think about. Um, and then, you know, I went off to college and stuff, but I watched it in a way where, yeah, I was like, I think this would be fun to do. But when I am masturbating, I hardly ever, especially nowadays, there was probably a period of time when I was younger, when I watched porn to masturbate, but now it's like all imagination all the time. And I think that's healthy. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's healthy to have a little bit of a mix, not totally rely on it. Like mm -hmm. it's still fun to look at visually, especially if maybe there's like a specific fantasy that I'm wondering how it would mm -hmm. play out. Mm -hmm. But um, I think now, you know, I've also shot so much porn. You know, like, you know, everybody. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like I can just write my own in my head, yeah. you know, yeah. it'll just get there immediately. <laughs> um, what were some of the, uh, the what was some of the content that you watched when you were thinking about getting in? I mean, you mentioned Sasha Gray, but I'd be curious, like what, what was the tipping point? for you where you watch that and you're like I could do it was there a genre or a particular like brand or anything um like I mean I got really into like the tumblr era uh -huh. of porn where it was mostly just kind of like photos and gifs and like little teases and stuff mm -hmm. and I mean I really I think I wanted to do it but I didn't really believe I could do it until a little bit later you know and then I like went to college and like got a real job and kind of like did the things you're supposed to do which I'm glad I did instead mm -hmm. of going directly from you know being young to doing porn I'm glad I kind of like went to college and mm -hmm. tried it out to know I didn't like it <laughs> you know so I can be like I tried it and it wasn't for me um but yeah I think the moment where I really realized I could do it was after I even started like because uh, I started selling my panties online for extra money which turned into photos and videos and kind of snowballed and it was still at that time just like oh just for extra money but then when people were actually like paying me for like pictures of me and stuff I was like oh, maybe I could actually mm -hmm. do this. Like I've been thinking it was this, you know, unreachable pipe dream for so long, which now is so silly to think about, you know, that I thought like, oh, I can't do that, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I've been doing it yeah. for like over four years. So it's just, it's just funny to like put myself back in that mind, in that mindset. But yeah, I think it was after I actually started like dabbling in sex work that yeah. I was like, oh wait, I can do this and yeah. like pretty well, you know? So um, you have to tell us, how did you get into used panty sales as like your your entry into sex work i think it was like a joke like someone else had mentioned it like i saw something on reddit that like someone sells their dirty panties like i remember it was just a funny antidote that someone else had told me about mm -hmm. like oh did you know like some people sell their dirty panties on the internet for extra money isn't that so weird and gross or something like that and i went is that a thing? And like Googled it yeah. and it sure shit was a thing. So, um, yeah, there was like some website I won't mention here cause it kind of sucked that specifically was for that. You could yeah. like anonymously sell panties. So I dabbled and it was fun. And it was like, at the time, a lot of money to me, you know, selling my panties for like 50 bucks a pop was yep. like, 
yeah, yeah, you know, it's pretty good. So it definitely started there. And then, you know, guys would want photos with the pictures and videos. Then, then I, I start sending you photos of them with the material. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that escalated to camming, you know. But the panties originally, I, yeah, it was just something like, I heard at like a friend say at a party and I went, oh, yeah, that's funny, you know, <laughs> and like looked it up and saw how yeah. easy it was. And so I think that's how I kind of stumbled into some sex work because like I wanted to do it, but I was just like, oh, no, like, you know, how do people even do it? And then I just tried it and I'm like, oh. It's yeah, really not that hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like then you start investing in vacuum sealers yeah. and all that. But I will I, say at the end of the day, I think also Kira said that that like any form of sex work, it's the best job in the world for some people and the worst job for everyone else. And I think I was born for porn. So I think for me, it was easy. You yeah. know, I don't like I never felt this like, I don't know, this innate like. I was doing something morally wrong. Like mm -hmm. I wanted to do it for a long time. And I just told myself like, no, you know, I should go to college and stuff. But it's not, I'm not uh, advocating for everyone to go try to sell yeah. their panties on the internet, you know? It, this would have been maybe like 2001, but one of my first forays into sex work in, in university was um, selling well-worn socks, which I ended up building a little network of mostly like, you know, my brother or like my girlfriend or like people yeah. to wear the socks to yeah. sell. So I, I very much know that community. I have a funny sock story because I was mostly doing panties and then I got a guy that wanted socks. Yeah. And I was like, OK, I guess it's the same as panties. You wear socks for a day, put it in a bag and mail them. So I did that and he was pissed. He was like, these socks are covered in dog hair. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, there's, I have a dog. There's dog hair all over the floor. Yeah, yeah. And so I went on this forum of other girls that like sold stuff. And I was like, okay, what do you guys do there? Like, you wear those socks you're going to sell and then you wear another pair over mm -hmm. to cover it up from the dog mm -hmm. hair. <laughs> Except for the people that want to see the footprint. Because there are, there's the subset of, of customers want that want to see the footprint. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, like my very short lived career in like hustling well-worn socks <laughs> Um, and you had to call them well-worn because at the time you were using, you know, mainstream platforms to sell them. And, uh, that was like the code word. Yeah. Um, but there was one particular pair of Argyle socks, like very, very distinct Argyle socks, yeah. uh, that we had sold to a, a gentleman who didn't live too far from mm -hmm. where we were. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he sent a photo of that very distinct Argyle sock wrapped around his face. And I downloaded that. It took like five minutes to download at yeah. the time. I downloaded that and I was like, nope, I'm done. <laughs> Got too real. <laughs> this is too much. There's people actually was, doing this, yeah, this weird is, shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For me, what, what became real about it was when it went from just being like, oh, anonymous on the internet to like, oh my gosh, that yeah. man has... My girlfriend's socks wrapped around his head and he's looking at he us. Huffing these socks. He's huffing these socks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Switching gears. Um, what was, uh, uh, tell me some of, uh, like you mentioned that, you know, you started kind of discovering your sexuality, being more sexually active, you know, as you were a teenager, kind of getting into young adulthood. What was some, what are some of the most like embarrassing or memorable moments of your sexuality during those years? If you were going to share a story with us. I mean, I have a really embarrassing story from the first time I had sex. Oh, okay, um, please. <laughs> I mean, I was just, I mean, I really didn't know anything about sex. It's like I had, you know, maturation in school and like talked about with my friends, but I, I wasn't really watching porn. I'd look at like some Tumblr gifts and stuff, but I wasn't watching porn. And so the first time I had sex, um, I was having sex with this boy and he kept telling me like, oh, your pussy's so tight. Your pussy's so tight. And I didn't know that was a compliment. Yeah. So I kept being like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I kept apologizing while we were having sex because I thought he was like complaining. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, it's so tight. Like, oh, it's too tight. But no, he was like trying to dirty talk with me. But I, <laughs> I didn't know that. So I kept apologizing. And I'm sure he was just like. Like, okay, yeah, <laughs> you know, there but, you go. So, there yeah, you go. just looking back on that now, it's hilarious when yeah. I think about it. But I just didn't, uh, wasn't really watching porn or knew anything about dirty talking, which now dirty talking is like what gets me off. Like, mm -hmm. I could just like use my vibrator and dirty talk to someone and that would make me come. Yeah. Like, I just love dirty talk now. Yeah. Awesome. Um, how would you say, like, your time working in porn? Um, what are some of kind of the lessons you've learned from your four years in? Lessons from porn? Mm -hmm. About my sexuality or about yeah. sex in general? About, like, about both. I think I've learned so much. I feel like most of my life has happened. Like, even though I've only been in porn, you know, like a little less than five years now, I feel like most of my big life lessons have really come from that. Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, it's hard to quantify. I don't know. You got to give me something like a specific. Well, let's let's think sexual health. Yeah. Because one of the things that I really want to do with this um, podcast series is to talk candidly about sexual health because there's such a lack of information out there. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of a lot of people, but certainly a lot of women who watch this, you know, um, have probably the same question. So what have you learned about like your own sexual health and prioritizing that within your life and career? I definitely, that's the number one question I get from civilian women is like, mm. how do you keep from getting like BV or like yeast infections all the time? Like I struggle with all the time. I couldn't imagine if I was having sex on camera. And I think, you know, we're told like you need to get like antibiotics every time you have like any weird vagina stuff mm -hmm. going on. And that's just like absolutely not true. There's so many things that you can do for your vaginal health. I mean, I think for everyone it's different. Like what works for me is usually like boric acid, tea tree oil. And some people like would never put boric acid up there. So mm -hmm. it's different for everyone. But I encourage people to at least look into it and to try those things, you know, um, because it is so much better for you <laughs> just taking antibiotics every single time. But I think just like not being embarrassed about it. You know, I think a lot of women like suffer in silence because they're embarrassed. You know, they don't want to like tell their partner like, oh, I can't have sex with you right now. I have a yeast infection. I need to get it rid of it. They mm -hmm. kind of will just suffer through it or not talk about it. Like, I know that's how I felt. I felt just very embarrassed about those things, mm -hmm. you know, and now I like, I, I don't love talking about it, but I, I love that I feel comfortable talking about it yeah. and that it doesn't make Make me feel like cringed out, you know, like I and I think just in general, we should treat most like STIs and stuff that way. You know, it's just a fact of life. Like mm -hmm. if you're going to be a sexually active adult. You're going to get an STI at some point in your life. And like, how are you going to handle that? You right. know, that's kind of the conversation I have with any civilian partners I have. It's like, I'm going to give you an STI at some point. It's not a win or it's not an if it's a win, yeah. like it's going to happen. And like, how are you going to handle that? Have you had it before? Do you know how to deal with it? Do you know how your body reacts? Because like everyone's immune system reacts differently mm -hmm. so I think just like seeking out the information and just accepting that like if you're going to be a sexually active person in the world you're going to get something just like if you go out in the world you're going to get a flu you're going to get a cold yeah and you don't go who gave me this flu I'm going to hunt them down and you know freak out and scream and shame them like it's mm -hmm. you got to like take accountability for your own shit at the end of the day and at the end of the day too you mm -hmm. know like it's your responsibility your own sexual health so and I think people know more about prep too I feel like it's Prep, it's crazy. It's like a miracle drug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody talks about it. Explain to uh, viewers who might be listening what PrEP is. Uh, PrEP is an HIV prophylactic. So if you do not have uh, the virus and you are taking PrEP daily like you're supposed to and you're exposed to the virus, you will not catch it. So if you're a sex worker, especially, I encourage all sex workers because it's like if you are having sex for, in exchange for money, you are at a higher risk of HIV. And of course, it's different in different you know, genders and stuff, but just at the end of the day, like if you're having sex for money, I really think you should at least try to be on prep. You know, I know maybe it doesn't work for everyone's bodies or like immune systems, but for me, it's been great. I don't have any side effects, um, no symptoms. And I think it's working how it's supposed mm -hmm. to. Be. So I definitely encourage that for most people. I had one girl on set and like, I think she was just naive. I don't think she meant it maliciously, but she went, isn't that a gay drug? I went, um, I mean, uh, gay people take it, <laughs> but like a gay drug, like you don't have to be gay to take it. Like, yeah. Not, but I think that is just like, she was being genuine. She wasn't yeah. trying to be like, that is just what she thought. And I think a lot of people just inherently think that, mm -hmm. you know, but I think for sex workers, like in our industry, for sure, I, I very much encourage getting on prep. One of the other, uh, I would say kind of big, one of the big lessons I've learned in, in my time in the sex industry has been, um, cultivating, um, conversations around consent and just consent as an overall subject. Um, maybe you can share some of your own reflections around the, the importance of consent in work, but also like how you bring that into your private life as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I definitely, I think I thought when I entered porn that I was really good at speaking up for myself, that I had a strong voice, but looking back on it, I didn't. Like, I really did let a, let a lot of shit slide because I mm -hmm. didn't want to be a diva. I wanted to get rehired. I wanted to be the cool girl. So I kind of went along with things without really voicing my opinions or did things maybe I wouldn't have done today, you know? So I think it's always good to kind of question yourself, like, are you really willing to, you know, like stick up for yourself and like speak up because just as important it is for, you know, 
other like people can't know your boundaries if you don't voice them. And I think that's where I was at. It wasn't necessarily other people's fault. I didn't tell them that I wasn't okay with certain things because I just wanted to go along with it. Yeah. And then I had to kind of live with that. Like, okay, I did some things I wasn't really happy with and I don't really have anyone else to blame except myself because I kind of just like went along with it. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad, like proud of myself for how far I've come in the last four years, just being able to like cultivate that voice. And then I realized like that kind of turns me on, like being able to like, say it how it is and like voice my opinions about things and I also realize like other people think that's hot you mm -hmm. know like people find confidence hot you to like say what you like and what you don't like you know because I think a lot of new girls like I was this way was like you know oh I don't have any no's you know yeah. I don't have a no list and you know you can just do whatever to me and it's like that's it's not true yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. like that's not true and you should be able to like define and kind of talk about like what does turn you on what doesn't turn you off and it mm. might change day to day mm. so I think yeah like definitely prioritizing you know respecting other people's boundaries but like really doing internal work asking yourself you know because it's like why are you okay with anyone just doing whatever they want to you like is that coming from a healthy place is mm -hmm. it because you haven't really thought about it like you maybe you know certain things haven't happened to you yet but when they happen you will be like oh wait actually that <laughs> is a hard boundary for me so I think being a lot more like kind of self-critical about what those are and kind of like asking yourself where those lack of boundaries or where certain boundaries come from, like, why are they there? Why aren't they there kind of thing? And that was something that took me this long to kind of really pin down and kind of like process. And so I would just encourage anyone is to really think about that, you yeah. know, in like a pretty critical way about um, what, like, you know, if you think you don't have boundaries, you know, why not? <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's a really good, a really good kind of piece of advice because I know that, f I mean, we're very used to, to having consent conversations as part of our production process. Um, certainly that hasn't been the case forever when I started producing, you know, it, it didn't no. exist. So we've had a big evolution as well, but I know, um, most people, in sort of civilian life or outside of sex work, like even just the prospect of having a conversation is so terrifying. Like, how do you think that maybe even us as an industry, like what can we do to help, you know, those just in, in their private lives kind of recognize that it is, it's not only okay to do it and it's essential to do it, but it's sexy to do it. Yeah. I think that's for like my personal life. When I have had sex with civilians, I've realized that it is so much hotter to ask for what you want, mm -hmm. you know, like, I like when you do this to my pussy, I like to have my feet licked, you know, mm -hmm. and like most partners, they are happy to oblige, you mm -hmm. know, and if they're not, like, I've also been in situations where men feel like I can, I've given like, a, oh, I like this when you do this, do this to me. And mm -hmm. it's like a don't tell me what to do. And that's what I'm like, red flag. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like if you feel intimidated by a woman or anyone like voicing what get brings them pleasure and you kind of go like, well, don't tell me what to do. Well, that's, that's a problem, you mm -hmm. know, but I, from my experience, I think when that communication is super sexy and it's like a level of vulnerability and like vulnerability and like truly knowing someone and what turns them on is really hot and just kind of like, being the cool girl or just going along with things. It's it's not confident. It's not sexy. And people mm -hmm. can usually see through it and it won't make you feel happy at the end of the day, you know? So, and also I think it's just like a little immaturity and like even people in their forties, you know, they feel weird about talking openly about what mm -hmm. are your boundaries and when they're about to have sex with and yeah. maybe you're not mature enough to be engaging in that sexual encounter if when you think about wait maybe before we have sex we talk about like so like you know our when's the last time you got tested like you know what's your relationship style are you monogamous non-monogamous what are you looking for like mm -hmm. if having that conversation before hooking up with someone makes you feel weird like you maybe aren't mature enough to be engaging in that and maybe that's when you need to do a little bit more self-work you know mm -hmm. or like on the other end, I've definitely had partners where like I try to have that conversation and I could tell they immediately got very uncomfortable. And to me, it's like, I don't think you're ready for me. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. like, sorry. Yeah. But it's a really good prerequisite to have before you sleep with somebody, right? Is like if you can't, if you can't, what does it say? If you can't like talk the talk, you can't walk the walk mm -hmm. or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the importance of of female pleasure. And certainly with, with Up Close, the whole focus behind our, our studio is really celebrating, uh, you know, female pleasure and authentic female sexuality in all of its forms. Um, so having shot a lot of porn, 
How does that vision resonate with you, especially in relation to like, you know, what's sort of being offered to a lot of people to watch? Um, do you think that's an important thing to include in our industry? Yeah, I think I think also including kind of sprinkled consent talks into the sex, mm -hmm. like in real life, you know, like in real life, if someone was, I don't know, like biting your nipple too hard, you might go, oh, I like it a little bit lighter, you know? So I, cause I think in, we're trying to create a fantasy. So you don't want to necessarily be like doing that, but I think having more scenes where that's kind of in it, you know, where we're actually, as we're going using lube on camera mm -hmm. instead of hiding it or, you know, having those like, oh, I actually like it when you do this better, you know? So I wish I try to do that more often. Cause I think, you know, sometimes we do just want to give into the fantasy, but then it's just not as realistic. And like, let's be real. A lot of people do learn about sex from porn, unfortunately, like they shouldn't, they really shouldn't at the end of the day. And I think like porn literacy should be more of a thing, but I do enjoy seeing that more sets now are like doing the consent talks and kind of including it in the videos mm -hmm. and uh, like showing viewers, like even if it's in that video, like we do do this, like just so you know, these videos are not done just off the fly. Like there is a lot of talks that go into it. These performers know each other mm -hmm. usually like, you know, for me now, most of the people I work with, I've known for like four years. So it's like we kind of know what each other likes and don't like, you know, so to have that kind of context, mm -hmm. I think is important. Yeah. Well, you're right in the sense that it is, we're not accountable for being sex educators, but we definitely are the default form of sex education, yeah. especially, you know, in Western countries where there's a lack of like cohesive sex education. Totally. Um, what brings you the most pleasure these days? What are you getting off to these days? God, what do I get off to? You know, weirdly enough, I have a lot of like, uh, I've, <laughs> My fantasy lately has been um, like kind of like zombie men, like taking like <laughs> hot guys and like scooping their brains out and just like using them as like sex dummies. Like that's honestly, I was even like talking about this with my partners. Like, you know, I've, I sometimes I jerk off to think about you just like a zombie. Like, yeah. You don't have even a brain in your head and I'm just kind of like using you for sex. So I think there's something really hot about like a human dildo. Like yeah. A, I was going to say, let's deconstruct that. Like let's, let's psychoanalyze yeah. that. What's, what's happening? What's happening there? In my brain. It's just, it's just like the confidence that you have that now you can take on a few zombies. Yeah, yeah. 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 My sex zombies. I was going to ask you what's a fantasy you've had that you haven't lived out yet. I don't know if I, if I don't know if I want the answer. That's definitely That's it. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I still haven't done a DP. I still haven't done a gangbang. Mm -hmm. I think I've been like, really want, like, it's so weird. You know, it's kind of how some people are with their virginity. They're like, I want it to be perfect. You know, it has to be the perfect person. And like, yeah. I never felt that way about my virginity. But for some reason, like the DP, the gangbang, I'm like, it has to be perfect. You know, it has to be just magical experience. It's just like such a weird thing to think about those things. But yeah. I do. I'm really excited to do those things. And I want it to just be like, magical. <laughs> so what would be your ultimate DP slash gangbang fantasy? Uh, gangbang firefighters. Okay. You know the answer. Oh my God. Yeah. I've thought about this a lot. I'm like, how much would it take to rent a fire truck? <laughs> like if I want to know where there is a fire. I do too. I've thought about there it. There you go. Yeah, I've thought about <laughs> it, but definitely like a fire a fireman gangbang has mm -hmm. uh, been a big thing on my mind. <laughs> So would you be up in a tree and you have to get rescued or would like it a cat? Yeah. Please help me. <laughs> All right. So good. Good to know. Now, now you answered that question very quickly. Is there a DP fantasy you've had in mind as well? Or you've just been fixated on the fire, the fire, uh, I mean, the, so the scene that we kind of co-wrote a little bit together with Nathan yeah. and Cody, where they were like the dirty, like landscaper guys. I like that. Like yeah. that idea of kind of just like two like laborers, all dirty and sweaty from a day of hard work, yeah. you know, and I'm just like a housewife. You're like, oh no, <laughs> that, I definitely like that. It's, it's pretty cliche, but like it's hot. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think in LA, we just don't see a lot of like sweaty hardworking men. Okay, guys, yeah. we need we need to find some good like working class guys. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. like where are the plumbers? Yeah. Where are the electricians? You know, that's who I really want to find. There you go. A, a plumber DP. I like that. Yeah. Um so for the, my last question today, you know, kind of going back to uh, the what we opened with, not the bunnies, but um <laughs> but the mission of this podcast, which is really, you know, to have candid conversations because we can, mm -hmm. and to hope that that offers some insight or advice to others. So for anyone who's watching this, but particularly women who may be feeling insecure about their own sexuality, what advice would you give them? God, I feel like I was so, like, I feel like I was so 
like horny and like wanting to experiment but so insecure with myself for so long and I'm so grateful for porn that now I like I really don't feel that level of insecurity I'm really excited when I have like a new fantasy or like something new I can kind of live out so I guess advice would be just like just know you're not the only one you know like everyone and most people are too busy thinking about themselves to think about you I think a lot of insecurity is like oh, what if I embarrass myself what if I put myself out there and someone thinks I'm a gross or weird or not hot you know and you just have to really like get over that and realize you know people are just too busy being insecure with their own sexuality and with themselves to be worrying about what you're doing and I think as soon as I realized that and like life is just too short mm -hmm. to not do what you don't want to do especially like you know, I think there's just so many examples of people that have lived their whole lives in the closet in one way or another, you know, sexually or not, and just living a whole life of regret. And it's just, I think I reached a point with that too. And that's kind of what got me into porn is I was like, I just don't want to live my whole life, you know, thinking, what if I could try this? And I never got to, and that's kind of what got me into porn is I had all these sexual fantasies and I just wanted to try them in a safe environment. And porn is kind of a good way, you know, like if you are a really horny person it's kind of a good way to safely have sex with all sorts mm -hmm. of different body types and peoples and environments and I yeah I mean I think at some point it, you just have to say fuck it <laughs> and just safely obviously like mm -hmm. with safety and consent and stuff but to just realize you know like no one like only you can make you know those changes no one's going to come into your life and pull you out of your insecurity like you kind of just have to get to a point where you're like I only have one life and I'm hot and just gotta have that confidence to mm -hmm. try something new because yeah I mean I've definitely been there and feeling so just like insecure about your sexuality and not really know how to define it you know especially if you're like into women and men and you know it's like and again when you're young there's not a lot of nuance or understanding for those things so I think you know just being like gentle with yourself and at the same time just realizing you know it's it's in your hands and mm -hmm. just take take control of it mm -hmm. well and it's it's so true that you are the center of your own attention but you're not often the center of other people's attention so that take a take a was, slice of humble pie and and that'll make you feel a lot yeah, better because i think a lot of insecurity comes from like what will other people think mm -hmm. of me? whether it's your family your friends or people you don't even know on the internet you know it's like mo that is most insecurity comes from is like yeah. what if i embarrass myself what if people judge me and i think just realizing like okay and yeah. And then what, you know, you'll still be fine. <laughs> like it's not the end of the world. And honestly, they probably won't. And that's what I experienced too, is like, I think, I mean, obviously people are going to have their own opinions on when you're doing porn, but I don't think it's a, uh, and I think for most people, it's not even about doing porn. I think for most women that feel uncomfortable in their sexuality, it's just for like asking for what they want in sex. They just feel like intimidated by that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like, do you want to look at your life when you're 80 and be like, wow, I never got to have the sex I wanted to have because yeah. I was too scared of being embarrassed, you know, or like whatever that insecurity comes from. Like, I think a lot of times just my mortality <laughs> makes me want to like try these things and kind of do it. You know, yeah. it's like you really do only have one life and you're only going to be. Like for me, I realize I'm only going to be this hot and young for a certain point and like I'm going to take advantage of that, <laughs> you know, like I'm going to take advantage of it while I can and not yeah. regret it. Yeah. Well, with only one life to live, I do hope very much in your future that there are some firemen involved and <laughs> uh, whatever small part we may be able to play in that, yeah. I, I will definitely take note. Uh, oh, thank God. you so much, Charlotte, for being here today. Thank you so much for sharing um, your perspective on your own experience and advice for others. Um, I really, really believe that as a community, we have so much value to offer um, in terms of that life experience and that candidness. So thank you for having the confidence to, to share. All right. Thank you, guys. Take care. All right. I'm trying to think of what my like favorite part of the conversation I had with Charlotte Sins was today, because I love Charlotte. I would talk to her for hours about anything. So I think my favorite anecdote was when she confessed to writing uh, porn star Sasha Gray in her diary growing up, um, but also what she had to say about boundaries. And if you don't think you have any boundaries, maybe you should question why you don't have them. Lots of good stuff to take away. That's why we do this podcast. That's why we have these conversations. So if you want to support 
Charlotte. If you want to support us, you can do so by liking, leaving your comments, subscribing to our channel, and you can also find all of our social links listed in the description below. As always, I appreciate your support and I look forward to having another great conversation with y'all next week. Take care.